Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, straight out of this psalm. Let's, let's uh, look through it from the beginning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Will you join in on the responsive lines here? Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. And of course, in the, the apostles' teaching, we are Israel today. We are the house of Aaron. We are the ones who are priests to God. And we, of course, we all are those who fear the Lord. So we say God's love endures forever, and we feel that that, that is for us. How? How do we know that? Well, the answer to that question, it's all about Jesus. Let's go on through this psalm. Verse 5 to 7. Read, let's read this together as well. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Song of great confidence, words of, of boldness, trust in God. We will not be afraid, <clears throat> no matter how many or whoever comes against us, because God is with us. Again, how do we know that? It is all about Jesus. Well, think about Palm Sunday. The crowd, as I say, quoted uh, the bit about Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from this psalm because it fitted. It fitted the occasion. But it fitted more than they knew. All of this psalm is about Jesus. Now, who wrote this? Well, it was written a long time before Jesus came, uh, quite possibly in the time of David, quite possibly by David. Traditionally, where the Psalms don't say who they're written by, people tend to assume uh, it might well be by David, and I'm going to assume this is written by David, because it fits. Now, if you have a pet theory that Hezekiah or some other worthy person wrote it, that's fine. Please don't be offended if I assume that it is uh, about David. But as the Holy Spirit was inspiring whoever wrote it in those old times, he was shaping their thoughts to anticipate things that would come true of Jesus. So this psalm speaks about, authentically about people's life in Old Testament times, but also looks ahead to what was going to happen to Jesus. Let's go through it. Let's read out these verses then. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And princes seems a somewhat irrelevant word these days, but if you think about politicians or people with influence, people in charge, <laughs> let's be careful about putting our trust in any human being who's in a position of authority. Better to take refuge in the Lord than in any human's especially perhaps those in charge. This was David's experience, wasn't it? David was betrayed by so many, betrayed by his wise advisors, betrayed by members of his own family, especially betrayed when those people ganged up against him and the rebellion of Absalom, David had to go on the run. But David was so used to being betrayed by many and he didn't put his trust in people but in the Lord. Well, Jesus too knew what it was to put trust in God rather than in people. Now, when we read on in the Gospel accounts, after the triumphal entry, Jesus goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple and drives out those who were, were trading there and what's meant to be a place for all nations to come and pray in the outer courts and draw near to God. And the way John writes this up in John's Gospel, John actually puts this at the beginning of the Gospel. I think probably Jesus did it more than once. Uh, you may prefer to think John wrote it there for theological reasons. But anyway, what John writes after Jesus did that uh, astonishing thing, uh, driving these traders out of the temple, 
John writes this, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, That's, it, it believed in Jesus. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them. For he knew all people. He didn't need any testimony about mankind. He knew what was in each person. Just quoting out to say that <laughs> this is directly relevant to Jesus. Jesus knew better than to trust in humans or trust in princes, people in authority. He didn't trust himself to anyone. When Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, even though this crowd was crying Hosanna, he still didn't trust them. <laughs> he allowed them to do what they did, but he knew what was in humankind. Well, let's read on. Back to the psalm. I'll, I'll read this. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. Now, cut them down is one translation. This is one of those words, uh, like in English, we have a word like ruler. Does it mean a measuring stick or does it mean a person in charge? Every time you come to translate a word, you have to think, what does it mean? Um, so this may mean cut down, but there's another word that just means pushed back. And personally, I think that's a, a better translation than the destroyed um, anyway, let me carry on. But I'll, I'll use that translation, push them back. Okay? They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I pushed them back. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I pushed them back. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Well, David certainly had victories like this. David had victories over the individual enemies that came against him, and also he led the nation of Israel in the martial, uh, you know, military victories against all the enemies, against the, the Philistines, and against uh, <coughs> um, Aram, Syria, uh, and against uh, Edom, and Moab, and Ammon. David led the people... In Fantastic victories because the Lord was with him over nations and personal enemies. But Jesus too had many, many enemies. This time when he was coming into Jerusalem, if, if you read on through what we call Holy Week, all kinds of people asking him questions in the temple day after day, trying to catch him out, mostly. One or two sincere questions, perhaps, but mostly uh, to put him on a disadvantage. And Jesus was able to push them away. To answer with astonishing wisdom. It just amazed people. Like that one about, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And he said, show me a coin. Whose face is on it? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give to God what belongs to God. What has God's image on it? That, that's... Our whole lives, we are the ones. Anyway, he pushed them back with great uh, wisdom, overcame them all. But behind all these human enemies, the Romans and the Jews, the, the, the religious and the civic authorities among the Jews, all trying to get rid of him, behind all those, there were those unseen spiritual forces. And uh, recently I spoke from Colossians saying how when Jesus was on the cross, he was getting rid of uh, every, the accusations that stood against us. And by doing that, he disarmed the devil and all the spiritual forces. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by his cross. So these words in this psalm about triumphing over enemies. Jesus, yes, he, he overcame, he pushed back all the human tricky questions, but much more than that. He was working to an everlasting victory over our spiritual enemies on our behalf. And he led them in his victory parade. Well, the next verse is, if we go back to the psalm, let's read this together again. The Lord is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. 
The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. If you know your Bibles well, you might recognise that first verse. It's a direct quotation from Exodus, from the Song of Miriam, after the people uh, have left the Egyptians behind. They've crossed the Red Sea, and then the Egyptian armies chased after them, and the waters have closed over all those pursuing enemies. And Miriam sings in Exodus chapter 15, The Lord is my strength and my song. Uh, that's another one of these homonyms, these ruler lines where it could mean defence, it could mean song. Uh, he has become my salvation. So that's a direct quotation. And this other stuff about the Lord's right hand comes in again and again uh, in that Exodus song as well as in this psalm. Echoes of Exodus. And Jesus was about to do something that was like Exodus, but even greater than what happened in Exodus. Do you remember the time that Jesus met Moses? You think, what am I talking about? Moses was way before. Yeah, Jesus was standing on that mount of, what they call the Mount of Transfiguration, and three of the disciples privately saw him become like glowing, revealing his glory, and then suddenly two people were standing there talking to him, and, and somehow they knew this is Moses and Elijah. And Luke writes that they spoke to him about his departure, or literally, they spoke to him about his exodus. Jesus was the one who was going to work something even greater than the exodus that happened coming out of Egypt. What happened in Egypt? The Israelites were set free. The hundreds of thousands of people set free from cruel slavery to human masters. But Jesus is setting free millions and millions, not just of one family on earth, but of all races and backgrounds, set free from a greater slavery, the slavery even to our own sin, to the fear of the devil and of death. He's working that huge exodus. So when we get these echoes of exodus, even this is about Jesus and what he was achieving. Well, some people look at these next verses and say, well, at least that's not about Jesus, is it? Because he did die. This must be just about David, saying, I will not die but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but has not given me over to death. Now David came near to death in many situations, but he did not die young. He died later at a ripe old age. He was rejected by people, um, but he, he didn't die young. Jesus gave himself over to death, but he did not stay dead. He entered the world of death, and then he broke it open from the inside. There had been, according to the Bible, a few people had been raised from death in the past, but they were always raised by somebody else from the outside, as it were. Jesus, it says, death could not hold him. Jesus entered the world of death, but he was not given over to it. It had no power of captivity over him. And Jesus entered the gates. He entered the gates of Jerusalem. This talks about entering the gates. Who may enter the gates? This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. At last, someone truly righteous is at hand. At last, someone truly entitled to glory in the name of God has arrived in the city. But it's not only... Uh, that he entered the gates of Jerusalem, he was going on to enter the gates of heaven. Having been crucified, raised from the dead, he would then open the way to enter heaven so that all of us can also draw near to God. And he would give to us the righteousness that he himself wore that's given to us so that we too may enter as the righteous. 
Well, the next verse, these are, these are astonishing. These are wonderful. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Well, it's about being rejected and how David was rejected. Even after defeating Goliath, David was rejected by Saul. Saul didn't say, okay, you'd better line up to be the next king after me. No, Saul rejected him and persecuted him and tried to kill him. And even after Saul was killed in battle, David was adopted by his own tribe, tribe of Judah, as the next king. But the other ten tribes in the north... They, they took their time, rejected by them. But it, David became the cornerstone. He was the one who established the nation. And, of course, God made him the start of a dynasty. Uh, 400 years uh, of kings in, until finally God sent them so many warnings that they ignored and they went into exile. But still the line continued, the line of David, and in time Jesus was born in that line. We say that although Jesus is David's descendant, he's greater, greater than David. Jesus is the real cornerstone. Yeah, this, this talked about things that, that were real in the time of David, but Jesus, we see, truly is the cornerstone. Indeed, Jesus quoted this when it, he talked about the, a parable of the, the vineyard and the people... Um, not giving the fruit, not giving the, the harvest to, to the owner of the vineyard. And of course, God is looking for a harvest of righteousness among his own people. And people knew he had told this against them. But Jesus says that at the end of that story, when the vineyard is taken away from those owners and given to others, who will honour God? So what's the meaning of this? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Because in that parable, uh, messengers were sent and they were rejected and killed. But God has set aside his special messenger, the one who was killed at the end, and made him the cornerstone. It says at the end here, the teachers of the law knew that Jesus was telling this against them, and so he was. But once again, quoting the, the, this psalm about uh, the stone the builders rejected, Peter remembered this very clearly. And in Acts, uh, when the apostles start to have confrontations with the authorities in Jerusalem, Peter said, Jesus is the stone the builders rejected. No, he says, the stone you builders rejected, <laughs> which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else. God has done such an important thing here. In the past, God overlooked all kinds of ignorance, but now that God has revealed his special one and only, the only temple of God is being built on this foundation stone. There's no one else. It's all about Jesus he is the only name given by which we must be saved. And later on, Peter would write about this in Peter's letter. It talks about, you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and precious. Yeah, what did humanity do? They rejected Jesus, put him on a cross. But God counts him of infinite value and precious. And he said, now you are being built into a, a living stones, you, you're becoming a temple being knitted together by God on that foundation. But he said, look, Jesus is so important. If anyone doesn't believe in Jesus, if anyone's not, not bothered or thinks he's rubbish, remember, these verses in bold at the end, to those who do not believe, remember the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And if you reject Jesus, if you refuse to build your life on him, the one and only solid foundation for life, well, beware what is ahead, because God has honoured him, the cornerstone, the life giver, but also the judge. So how marvellous, how marvellous, and how wonderful they even know all of humanity together ganged up against Jesus and all the powers of hell 
God has established him, the cornerstone, the one in whom is life for all mankind. So we get on to the verses that were quoted by those who greeted Jesus coming into the city. Let's sing together, or say it together. Lord, save us! Hosanna! Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So Hosanna, so literally that means save now and it became shortened and simplified, became a word of, of praise and honour. Hosanna, that we now use in our worship songs. Uh, well, we've talked about that then. But this bit about the end, the, the, the last couple of lines are a bit tricky to translate. It's not clear exactly how the, the Hebrew is meant to be interpreted. Something about procession up to the horns of the altar. It may mean bind the sacrifice to the, the altar, something about getting ready for sacrifice. Back in the time of David, perhaps he would have led the procession and they would have taken a share in passing up the, the lamb that was going to be sacrificed along the line to where only the priests could actually do the offering in the altar. But Jesus, he was the one who was the sacrifice, the willing sacrifice. Jesus came, that he would be bound not to the altar but his hands bound and nailed to that wooden cross where he would bear the penalty of our sins. So we've talked about how this psalm applied to David and to Jesus and we could go through and consider which parts we can count are ours well, as we come to these last two verses, let, let's claim these for ourselves, shall we? Read them out together again. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Enduring love. Love that lasts forever. As I said at the beginning, how do we know well, this is how we know. It's all about Jesus. Jesus has demonstrated, has set out, has fulfilled totally the love of God for us. And the Apostle Paul writes it this way. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how we know that God loves us forever. He's Loving faithfulness endures for us. He's proved it. He's demonstrated it. He's set it out so you can't miss it. He came willingly to die for us. We said earlier it's best not to trust in humanity or human authorities, but to trust in the Lord. We can't be trusted. Jesus knew when he came in and let that crowd welcome him that they couldn't be trusted. Maybe some of that crowd were in the same crowd, what, five days later, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. The only thing Jerusalem could be trusted to do was to crucify our Lord Jesus Christ. And I say this not to say that the people of Jerusalem were especially wicked, they were the generation, that, but they represent us, our human race. It's what we're all capable of, it's what we could do what we would do if we could get our hands on God. That generation showed. And yet Jesus came willingly. He entered the city knowing what everything was building up to, knowing the time was right. It was coming up to the Passover when he'd fulfill all the sacrifices given in the Old Testament. He came willingly. Humanity can't be trusted, but he can be trusted and his love endures forever. So we can look back through this lovely psalm. I hope, I hope you've appreciated some of the things that we've read. The, verse 6, the Lord is with me. 
or it's literally the Lord to me, so the Lord with me, the Lord for me. Who can be against us if God is for us? It's all about Jesus that we believe God is for us. He gave his life for us while we were still sinners. He has become our salvation. Verse 14, he is my strength and my song, he has become my salvation. How has he done that? We've seen it literally bodily becoming our salvation on the cross. So, verse 24, what, we're so familiar with the, the verse in the translation, this is the day the Lord has made. Uh, but like quite a few languages, the word for make and do are the same. Uh, I think it probably really means this is the day the Lord has done it. This is the day the Lord has done it. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to sing the song Cornerstone now, which um, I haven't always liked this, but I, I like it now. And it really sums up quite a lot of what we've been getting at in this song. Let's sing Jesus Christ, Cornerstone. <laughs> 